All right, everybody, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, we're excited to host this discussion this afternoon about the far right anti trans feminist crossover and what communities can do to protect transgender, detransitioned, retransitioned, and gender diverse people. Before we get started, um, I will share that Firestorm is a 14-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective on Cherokee land uh, in Southern Appalachia. We strive to feature books and events that are relevant to our interests and the needs of marginalized people in the South. Uh, and we've been doing events like this one for the last three years um, online and are continuing to do online events um, both because we love to connect with people at a distance and also because we know that COVID continues to be a huge barrier for folks in our community. Over the next month, uh, we'll be doing events on the history of anti-racist action, the lives of sex workers, um, plus continuing an online reading group on Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives Beautiful Experiments. So if you're, interesting, uh, if you're interested in signing up for future events, please do follow us on social media and I'll share a link uh, to our calendar in the chat. So please note that we are using Zoom's Q&A tool. Uh, if you have any question at any point as we go, uh, you can find that located at the bottom of your screen, or if you're joining us live from Facebook, you can use the comments section of the stream. Uh, so we're gonna get started. This afternoon, I'm joined by two researchers from Health Liberation Now, uh, that would be uh, Kai Skeevers and Lee Lavelli. Health Liberation Now is a free resistance resource offering critical insight into the gaps in transgender health and connected politics for transgender, detransitioned, non-binary, and gender diverse people. Everyone has a right to safe, effective, and compassionate health care that reflects the full spectrum of their needs, experiences, and right to self-determination. Kai Skeevers is a gender-weird human passing as a transmasculine butch dyke, previously known as Crash Chaos Cats. She lived as a detransitioned woman for seven years and helped create the radical feminist detrans women's community. She became disillusioned and um, with radical feminism and now uh, sees that what she went through was a kind of anti-trans conversion practice. She's since disengaged from her former community and works to raise awareness of the harms and dangers of ideologically motivated detransition. She also uses her background to help monitor and resist TERPs and other anti-trans activists. She aims to help create better resources for trans and detrans people. Lee Lavelli is a Jewish disabled trans androgynous who has been a radical health liberation advocate for over a decade. He first wrote about his experiences in the late 2000s, delving into disability justice, trans rights, and psychiatric oppression. Over time, he began organizing with trans and detransitioned people for health equity, only to resign after witnessing organized efforts to undermine trans health care. He reemerged to the scene in late 2020, spilled Health Liberation Now an online resistance resource for community organizers fighting for queer and trans liberation. So thank you so much for being here today. Welcome uh, Kai and Lee. We're really excited to hear what you have to share. And I know you've prepared um, a really wonderful presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to y'all. Thank you. We're super excited to be here too. Yeah, very excited. And uh, this is Kai. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I am Lee. Um, apologize in advance for for not having any sort of camera on here, but we've got this lovely uh, slideshow that we've been able to prepare for everybody. Um, and so my my hope is that you know we're we're able to to really kind of like inform people about some of the stuff that's been going on over the past few years, how things have kind of escalated to the point that we're at now, but also like being able to to talk about how people have been able to successfully resist some of the, the anti-trans mobilization that's been happening in local communities and just sort of, you know, further inspire that that sense of, you know, 
collective resistance. Mm-hmm. And we're going to try, uh, try to cover a lot of ground today, which means we can't necessarily go into like super deep dives into mm-hmm. particular topics, but it's more like an overview. And we're going to try to focus on um, like organizations and individuals that we see being most active mm-hmm. at the moment. Um, some of them. Yeah. Uh, if we talked about them all, we'd be here all day. But um, and we're going to try to uh, cover everything like, uh, you know, in detail, but as concisely as possible. So there will be time at the end for people to ask questions, um, hopefully. Yeah, we we will do our absolute best to keep things on track here. There is the possibility that things will run over. Um, but we both like to talk and share information. <laughs> But also yeah. just want to give folks um, a heads up about some standard content warnings um, because of the nature of our work. You know, there is going to be references to things like transphobia, transmisogyny. Um, there's a there's a lot of like anti-Semitism that ends up getting involved in this stuff, Islamophobia, racism. Um, as expected by the description of the event, you know, we will be talking about swerfism, anti-sex work activism, um, and, you know, how this ends up folding into QAnon and actual violence on the, um, you know, by the hands of TERFs, police, and fascists. We are going to try to keep things light, and there's no real, like, graphic images or anything like that, but, mm-hmm. you know, it 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 is still kind of a heavy thing. Yeah. yeah. All right, so just to give folks uh, some more background here, let's talk about TERFs, SWERFs, and eco-fascists. Oh my. Okay, so kind of the ideological roots of uh, the current, you know, anti-trans activist network we've been monitoring. Obviously, you know, TERFs, TERFism, Mm -hmm. so trans-exclusionary or trans-eliminationist radical feminism, and then closely linked is SWERFism, um, sex worker exclusionary radical feminism, um, and like, so while the term was originally developed for swarfism, um, you know, carceral feminism has the idea that there are pockets of feminism that rely on the enforcement of the state and police incarceration, that sort of thing, in order to maintain their version of quote unquote liberation for all women, which isn't actually true. Yeah. Now, I would argue, especially now. Um, that yes, and because we, we lost your audio just a bit there, just for the oh, last no. sentence. Oh, no. Yeah, that was me basically saying that, you know, TERFs are also covered under carceral feminism. Yeah, I mean, they're often the same people. And yes, they both want to use the state uh, to enforce their version of feminism onto <laughs> other people, which is it's really mm-hmm. just violence. Okay, so also um, laying some of the ideological roots or reactionary strains of ecofeminism. Ecofeminism is a form of feminism uh, that connects uh, environmental destruction with patriarchy and with nature. And uh, you know, some turfs are ecofeminists, and relatedly, some are also ecofascists. Which you know, ecofascism is authoritarian groups and ideologies which combine fascism and environmentalism. Okay, so. Very quick overview of the history of TERFism. So in the early 70s, TERF groups like the Gutter Dykes and individual TERFs like Robin Morgan attacked trans lesbian feminists like Beth Elliott and Sandy Stone and tried to drive them out of the larger uh, feminist movement and lesbian communities. And then in 1979, Janice Raymond published The Transsexual Empire, which called for the elimination of transsexualism, which we all know really means like calling for the elimination of trans people. Uh, That work in particular mostly focused on trans women. And then uh, particularly relevant to what we'll be talking about today, in 2013, Lear Keith founded Women's Liberation Front, which that group uh, ended up being a a big driver of uh, pushing TERFs, like encouraging TERFs to work with the right to attack trans people. And related to that, um, so in 2019, we saw the development of a new organization, international based, um, by the name of Women's Human Rights Campaign. Now, They have since had to rename themselves to Women's Declaration International, possibly for legal reasons. Um, But this group was originally founded by, um, you know, some notorious swerfs, actually, Sheila Jeffries, uh, Maureen O'Hara, and Heather Brunskill Evans over in the United Kingdom. Um, And, you know, Sheila Jeffries in particular has like lengthy history um, in anti trafficking and anti porn movements. Um, Part of the reason why she developed 
Women's Declaration International is because she views trans people as an extension of the porn industry. And she strengthens this idea by, uh, weirdly enough, looking up a lot of alien gender swap porn on Amazon. It yeah. is very strange. It's but one of those anti-porn feminists who can't stop looking at porn. It's really <laughs> odd. But yeah, yeah that's so odd. that's you know, this is an international organization, right? Like while they have some of their main roots in the United Kingdom, they will have chapters all around the globe, some more successful than others. Um, And they do have, uh, you know, a pretty strong influence here in the United States, Mexico and Spain. So Swerfism, this is one of the angles that I feel isn't really covered enough in my opinion. And so I really wanna be able to focus some more on this to give, um, you know, kind of a bridge in terms of the connections here. Um, and so like one of the really influential moments um, in history was actually a conference in 1987 by the name of the Sexual Liberals and the Attack on Feminism. This was a conference that was attended by over 800 second wave feminists, largely with an anti-porn uh, anti focus, right? So some of the most notable uh, speakers or attendees included Sheila Jeffries, Twist Butler, who was a Mormon feminist, um, Phyllis Chesler, as evidenced by the photo here, Janice Raymond was there, Catherine McKinnon, Kathleen Berry, Mary Daly, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the really influential movers, right? And in contrast, some of their strongest critics was another feminist group by the name of Feminists Against Censorship, or FACT. Um, and part of the reason for that was because Feminists Against Censorship viewed the, um, like, the SWERF collaborations with the state as another arm of maintaining government control over freedom of expression, a form of censorship. Mm -hmm. And just like authoritarianism in general. They were yeah. kind of like, yeah, this is going to have bad consequences down the road, <laughs> uh, which they were right about. You know, so a lot of these people did end up forming alliances with conservative Christians and the state. And I think there was one uh, particular article you wanted to Yeah, talk yeah, about. yeah. So a lot of people know about, uh, uh, you know, swerves working with uh, conservatives go after porn. Oftentimes people don't know as much about their uh, anti trafficking work. So they started making alliances with conservatives and uh, conservative Hey, oh, we're, we're losing audio again. I think it might oh, be no. an issue of the microphone being covered or something a little bit, if you want to just back mm. up just a tiny smidge. Let's let's try okay. that. Is that any better there? That sounds great. Okay. okay. Um, what was the last thing that y'all heard? <laughs> um, Christian, uh, Christian collaboration. Mm. Okay. So, um, yeah. So... Swerfs, like, you know, going, you know, starting in the 80s, they started working with uh, conservative Christians to, like, go after porn, for example. But later on, they also formed alliances both um, with, with evangelical Christians and also started working with the U.S. government to uh, start doing anti-trafficking work, which to them meant, uh, you know, for them, anti-trafficking means going against, like, sex workers' rights and liberation. Um, so in, like, the early, like, during the Bush administration, uh, Bush Jr. in the early 2000s, like some of the SWERF started uh, working with that administration and exerting more of an influence. And in 2004, uh, two SWERFs, Phyllis Chesler and Donna Hughes, uh, wrote, uh, wrote an article for the, for the Washington Post where they encouraged feminists to work with uh, conservative and religious groups, both to fight against, you know, sex workers' rights under the guise of fighting sex trafficking, and also to, quote, defend the West against Islam. Um, uh, you know, Phyllis Chesler is notoriously Islamophobic, and both of these people, Chesler and Donna Hughes, um, in addition to being swerfs, ended up, in, ended up engaging in, you know, turf and anti-trans activism years mm -hmm. later and encouraging the same tactics. Yeah. Um, that they were encouraging people to do in the early 2000s. Yeah. And so, like, I mean, it, it's really important to understand that. So SWERFs generally view all forms of um, sex work as a form of sex trafficking inherently. So it's really no surprise that some of these people that were at the conference would go on to found the organization called Coalition Against the Trafficking in Women just one year after the conference itself, right? And so this was initially founded by Kathleen Berry, 
and Dorcheen Laidholt. Um, over time in 1994, Janice Raymond would become the co-executive director. Um, and, you know, by 1991 here as well, the, uh, the movement was expanding nationally, uh, internationally at this point, right? You know, they would have conferences over in Europe. They would draft proposals for UN declarations. Um, and they would develop new chapters all across the globe, right? So over in Asia Pacific, um, which would cover parts of Australia as well, they would have European chapters and they would expand over into Latin America and the Caribbean, which again, Janice Raymond ended up having a significant amount of influence. Sheila Jeffries ended up going over to Cat W Australia before she got involved in Women's Declaration International. And like, you know, this ends up connecting in with the rescue industry as well, um, which along with the common elements of government regulation, use of police enforcement and incarceration, there was an increasingly Christian focus, um, including having specific nonprofits throughout the country and again, internationally, um, that would, you know, in their efforts to to save women from, from the sex trade, they're also trying to convert them to their own form of Christianity, sort of like as a requirement for being able to get access to any form of, you know, direct supports, going to prayer sessions, reading the Bible, that kind of thing, right? Um, and, you know, as digital technology advanced, the, the ways that they were working with government systems also started to change where they put um, a heavier focus on controlling things like online venues or distributors. Um, so we ended up seeing the likes of FOSTA SESTA passing here in the United States, which unfortunately also helped us like lay the groundwork for some of the anti-queer censorship bills that we are starting to see today. Um, by, you know, by 2020, you know, QAnon at this point had already started as a phenomenon. You know, the first Q drops were back in 2017, but in 2020 was when the like hashtag save our children campaigns were really starting to kick up inherently built on conspiracy theories, right? About so trafficking. yeah, specifically yeah. about trafficking. So there was a heavy focus on things like George Soros and Pizzagate and children being stolen or kidnapped for trafficking purposes and many, many references to like, you know, satanic abuse and the likes right tying right back into some of the like the fear mongering that could end up happening with more evangelical directions yeah and and conspiracy theories about like george soros um you know funding uh sex workers rights and, and liberation movements like that's very common among swerves so it's not that surprising that they also end up believing that he's you know funding trans activism as well oh yeah uh, this was know, this was a really like popular one mm -hmm. for Janice raymond actually yeah, yeah. yeah. She loved to blame Soros for, for funding the like the sex industry. It's mm -hmm. really weird. Um, so by 2022, you know, um, the same year as the uh, you know Save Our Children campaigns, we had the the start of the WDI USA chapter itself, right? And then in 2022, they had their national political convention. The reason why this is important is because <laughs> weirdly enough, several of the speakers from the 1987 conference also ended up at that political convention. Huh. So we ended up seeing the likes of Phyllis Chesler zoom in to give her presentation. Janice Raymond offered a video and Twist Butler was there in person. Yeah, and Twist Butler, she's a Mormon feminist who has very deep pockets and has funded a lot of uh, Swerf and Turf movements. Also, wasn't Melissa Farley also at the convention? She was at the convention. She was not at the conference. Okay, I believe. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. All right. Um, and yeah, so weirdly enough to, to tie this back to Cat W is the fact that, so, I mean, Sheila Jeffries, she founded WDI after she was already doing the work in Cat W Australia, but then there's Kathleen Berry, one of the people who initially founded the organization. While she didn't actually present with WDI at any point, she did sign their transgenocidal declaration on women's sex-based rights in September 2020. Yeah. And the, the declaration, we can't really go in depth to it now, but like it's trying to like modify like UN yeah. policy. It's like trying to they're trying to create a document that can be used at an international level mm -hmm. to attack like trans people and trans rights. And they're using some of the uh strategies that they learned doing this international like mm -hmm. uh, 
for activism. Yeah, yeah, basically taking the idea of like that draft UN declaration from Cat W, but putting it into a more anti-trans direction, but they didn't even use some of the same processes. They didn't actually consult with any real stakeholders. They mm -hmm. just put this together via email and Facebook. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. it was kind of weird. <laughs> this is they, like a lot of the same people, they learned all these, you know, strategies as, as twerps and now we're like taking them into the, the modern turf movement. Okay, so another um, ideological route, um, which you're briefly going to touch on, uh, this is actually something I've been researching a lot and want to write more about eventually, but um, so reactionary forms of ecofeminism. So ecofeminism, you know, it's not, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say it's inherently reactionary, you know, it's a form of feminism that uh, sees connections between women and nature, as well as between patriarchy and the destruction and exploitation of nature. And there are like, intersectional and materialist and queer versions of ecofeminism, but some strains have been very bioessentialist and reactionary, and some uh, ecofeminists have been TERFs. So um, you know, ecofeminists who are TERFs oppose trans people and medical transition because they see it as a form of patriarchy, like dominating and dissociating from nature. You know, they'll make claims that, for example, like uh, you know, trans women are attempting to colonize women's biology, you know, quote unquote biological women. Um, and, you know, like I said, some, some eco-feminists have been TERFs, most notably would be like Mary Daly, um, and her, like the eco-feminism of people like Daly and Andre Goulard and Susan Griffin have influenced TERFs like Janice Raymond and Lear Keith and Jennifer Bielek. And, uh, similarly, there's, um, like, Ecofeminism can be a pathway into anti-trans activism, and then you also have uh, ecofascism, which similarly uses people's, uh, you know, interest in trying to to save the environment and nature to draw them into reactionary uh, politics and ideology. And we're just going to focus on one particular ecofascist group, uh, Deep Green Resistance, which is an authoritarian accelerationist group calling for the destruction of industrial civilization and not caring that that would lead to lots of mass death and suffering. Um, so we are, and you know, and they also are swerps and turfs because one of their original founders, Lear Keith is a swerp and a turf. So in 2007, Lear Keith organized the Deep Green Resistance Confronting Industrial Culture Conference in Deerfield, Massachusetts. And then later in 2011, Keith, Derek Jensen and Eric McVeigh published a book called Deep Green Resistance and also started an organization of the same name. Uh, but people were soon, uh, you know, they were, they, you know, they tried to like recruit people in environmentalists and radical and radical and anarchist communities, but soon faced pushback for, you know, their accelerationism and, and ecofascism and their anti-trans views. Uh, and eventually in 2013, DGR started getting expelled from those communities, you know, for those reasons, including for their transphobia. Mm hmm yeah, there was there was this whole big thing actually where they were at a um, you know a, a leftist conference and they had a table there, right? And so the, the tableists were being, you know, they were being pretty antagonistic, even though the the organizers were telling them to sort of chill it out. There was um, there was a trans woman that they were continuously misgendering at that point to the point of you know understandable frustration on her part and she started to scribble on their books um eventually some some brave soul ended up throwing a burrito in their direction and by that point all bets were off all bets were off um and so you know they started to get expelled from green spaces more and more and more and you know um deep like there was a statement that ended up going out from earth first journal collective where they essentially um refuse to stop, you know, they refuse to publish any more material from Deep Green Resistance, um, citing their prolific transphobia, and as it turns out, the cancellation of trans-inclusive policies from their leadership, even before the deplatforming started. And then, so around that time period, um, we've got the lovely introduction of Jennifer Bielek. So, according to Jennifer Bielek, who, to be fair, is not the most reliable narrator. But according to Jennifer Bielek, she had been tasked by Derek Jensen himself to try to find new venues for Deep Green Resistance. This was not going well. 
she noticed that they were continuously getting canceled. Um, and so she decided that she was going to start doing some research as to why they were getting continuously canceled. This research ultimately led her to conclude that uh, the people responsible, trans people, and Jews, of course. Yeah, that's where she started developing her conspiracy theories about how um, billionaires who happen to be Jewish, uh, trans feminine, or gay were part of a secret transhumanist plot to basically like destroy human biology and turn everyone to cyborgs or something like that. And trans people are supposedly supposed to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the first places she published her theories was in this anthology called Female Erasure that came out in 2016. She published a essay with uh, Mary Kala called The Absence in the Absence of the Sacred, the Marketing of Transgender uh, Medical Transgenderism and the Survival of the Natural Child. But her kind of her big breakthrough article is when she published an article in The Federalist in 2018 called Who Are the Rich White Men Instituting Transgender Ideology, where she just laid out all of her conspiracy theories about, you know, Jewish and trans billionaires uh, supposedly promoting uh, trans activism and trans medicine as part of this transhumanist plot. As as you can guess, of course, George Soros was blamed. Yes, yeah. yes, George Soros was in there, as was Jennifer Pritzker. And more recently, I believe this was last year uh, in 2022, she gave a presentation at this uh, conservative college in Washington, D.C. called Hillsdale College. Um, and uh, her talk was endorsed and promoted by Jay Richards from the Heritage Foundation. And Bielik is, um, she's important. I mean, she developed these conspiracy theories which have now spread like globally. Um, and, you know, it's spread both among TERFs and also uh, conservatives and fascists, but she also spreads other conspiracy theories into mm -hmm. the TERF, uh, into, you know, TERF subcultures and also spreads like right-wing and fascist propaganda. Yes. So she's like, so she, her ideas have spread and she also spreads other ideas. And so she's played a huge role in terms of the TERF and far-right crossover. And then, so I just want to read off a, a quote from the Deep Green Transphobia Statement, which I'm also going to put into the chat here in full the, for the people full yeah. in case you want to read it. So the oppression of women is inextricably linked to the oppression of trans people. Trans people have been honored in numerous indigenous communities across the planet. Trans people aren't some sort of new postmodern manifestation of individualism. Trans people are people people who have worked on the journal collective and stood on the front lines of the ecological resistance. Oh boy. And so going into where we're at now, Tianan or the turf fascist crossover. So what on earth do I mean by Tianan? So as, as you can expect, TNON is kind of like an evolution of QAnon with an explicitly anti-trans focus, hence the T. What I will note is that like the seeds of TNON were starting to manifest even before QAnon actually developed. So like, you know, this potential has kind of always been there. It's been rooted in it from the start, even if it hadn't been quite as explicit of a focus there in the beginning. Um, and so as one can expect, there's definitely some heavy roots of anti-Semitism, white supremacy, and great replacement theory. Um, the great replacement theory angle is a little bit unique in this department um, because it's most heavily focused on the idea, especially as it pertains to trans women, the idea that trans women are replacing cis women. They'll like, you know, call people sex mimics and stuff like that. It's, it's really bizarre. Synthetic sex identity, like LARPers, all sorts of awful mm -hmm. terms, like you know, implying that trans people are artificial or mm -hmm. made up. And like another uh, component of kind of like the white supremacist and great uh, replacement conspiracy theory is like some uh, anti trans conspiracy theorists, including Jennifer Bielik, also uh, Alex Aaron, the woman behind the, the gender mapping project, the one that like mapped out all the clinics so they could be attacked um like they claim that the evil you know transhumanist conspiracy um is specifically targeting white youth like they are specifically trying to like make white 
young people transition and be sterilized and you know merge with technology and yeah and, and they even will go out so far to claim that you know that people of color are not coming out as trans or transitioning even though that's like completely detached from reality from what i remember mm -hmm. there was a recent study that actually found that uh people of color were more likely to come out as trans uh compared to white people but but yeah but like you know so it's yeah. yeah, another example of how transphobia is like bound up with uh, white supremacy. Yeah, there's also there's a lot of heavy focus on again conspiracies, but this time um, the heaviest focuses tend to be on big pharma or big tech, right? And so the big pharma angle is the idea that like you know trans people are inherently uh, connected to the pharmaceutical industry to the point of you know being a, a major profit. Uh, source like, like, um, medical patient it, yeah it's also very ableist obviously yeah definitely um but then there's also the big tech angle right so there's there's this idea in anti-trans spaces of how supposedly trans people have been able to capture basically any industry that we supposedly touch including the tech industry to the point where we supposedly have like an unusual amount of control. The the best example of this is the like the bizarre conspiracy theory that there is one trans person at Twitter who is responsible for erasing all of the likes on a single JK Rowling tweet. Yeah. They honestly believe this. Yeah. And it's it like, not real. Again, like complete <laughs> versus of the reality where you know if you're a trans person on social media, you know that you know you can get death threats on Twitter and report that and you know nothing happens. Yes, yeah, like you know, or you get banned. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times like trans people get banned and like trans folks can just run wild. Um yeah. Anyways. So connected to the the conspiracies about big pharma though is inherently alt health grifting that we end up mm -hmm. seeing. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap. Um, a lot of TERPs kind of come out of like uh, so called kind of like natural birthing communities. Like a whole lot of people like their their TERP origin story has something to do with you know being a midwife and being opposed to trans inclusive language for reproductive care and then going down a rabbit hole and ending up believing in all these you know conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. uh, also, like a lot of TERPs like uh, that we watch, you know. Yeah, they're they're they'll do like life coaching. They're into the whole like natural birthing, midwife world, into like herbalism, uh, hypnotism. Uh, sometimes uh, sell themselves as you know basically offering conversion practices to uh, transphobic parents of trans youth. Mm -hmm. So you know, and it, it, this is common. Like you know, lots of people who have been following other groups that get involved in you know believe in conspiracy theories. There's a big overlap between like alternative health communities and mm -hmm. people who get into conspiracy theories and reactionary politics. Which is interesting because also this ends up incorporating um, fascist and anti-abortion tactics, despite the fact that, um, you know, a significant number of folks involved in this stuff have been coming from like natural birthing communities. And so like what they'll end up doing is, you know, there's a lot of circulation of online disinformation and trolling and the likes, right? Sometimes they'll take itty bitty little sound bites or videos or screenshots and they'll post it online and it'll circulate that with the distortion of what it actually means. Um, sometimes this information that they grab is from fake whistleblowers, right? Somebody who will crank call a clinic um, or even physically show up in order to try to, to feed this community with disinformation to then circulate. You know, call up and pretend to be like, you know, a parent of a trans child. Mm -hmm. I have a 13 year old who wants top surgery. Can I make an appointment? You know, we'll call up a, a surgeon's office or mm -hmm. something like that, record the call and then act like it's all this scandalous thing. Yeah. Um, We've also unfortunately been seeing a significant uptick in the targeting of clinics that are offering gender affirming care, especially ones um, that offer support for trans youth, as well as attacks on queer and trans community centers. But one thing that like I really want to stress here is the fact that this is not limited to a single political party or group, right? When we think of QAnon, like the first thing that tends to come to people's minds is like really far right stuff, right? But like TNON is a lot more diverse than that. We end up seeing people coming in oftentimes from like an environmentalism background mm -hmm. too. So That's... it's actually really important to like 
feel in your own community against these kinds of influences. Yeah, we see right? people from all kinds of uh, political backgrounds can end up uh, getting into TNN. It's like a way that like people who originally, you know, consider themselves leftists or liberals end up uh, on the right through getting into TNN style conspiracy theories. So I just want to go over a little bit about the stages that I've kind of noticed that this has been going on in, right? As I've been doing the research of the general timelines of how this phenomenon has been operating, I've been able to kind of break it down into three general stages, right? Formation, solidification, and escalation. The formation stage is the time period that started, you know, before 2014 at various points up until 2015. This is the time period when online writings from detransition turfs in particular started to become more popular, hence the subject becoming, you know, embedded into various parts of media later on. Um, this is also the time period where, again, DGR was getting deplatformed from a bunch of green spaces uh, for transphobia, which then led to the formation of Women's Liberation Front and Jennifer Bielek starting her research. Then there's the solidification stage, which ran from about 2016 to 2019. And here we started to see more like secular online theory crafting about quote unquote gender ideology. Gender ideology as a concept has mostly Catholic roots and does predate this, but things were starting to shift by this time period to cover a lot more like you know, political ground, right? So it wasn't just being restricted to like Catholic circles. Um, you know, we also started to see a, a blitz of anti-trans media articles, some of which were coming from Jennifer Bielek herself, as we saw the emergence of the idea that trans people are a Jewish transhumanist plot, in part thanks to her 2018 Federalist article. Um, and then, you know, by 2017, that's when we started to see the formation of QAnon officially, when it also had very early signs of interest in anti-trans and quote unquote groomer rhetoric. Then we've got the escalation stage, which started approximately in 2020, um, around the start of the pandemic and is still ongoing, right? This is when we started to see the full fusion with QAnon, like the fusion is complete at this point and it's, it's still going. Um, you know, protests had been starting to, to target clinics and local communities, and they would begin to, to increase over time. Um, fascists started to appear at turf events and vice versa. Um, sometimes you'd even catch them shaking hands with each other on camera. Mm -hmm. um, and we also started to, to see like an increase in fascist and turf violence against, like, against counter protesters um, and community spaces were getting attacked. Okay, so now we're going to talk some about um, you know, on the ground protests that we've seen. So, I mean, some of the ones most notable is like protesting outside of clinics and hospitals, also sometimes surgeons' offices that offer gender affirming care. And they mostly target ones that offer care to trans youth in particular. Uh, sometimes they end up targeting specific healthcare providers, including they'll have like signs with their faces on them, like saying, like calling them like butchers or accusing them of, you know, doing all sorts of awful. Mm -hmm. shit and the whole point is like you know to intimidate and harass that specific healthcare provider and try to encourage them to you know stop doing that stop providing healthcare um they'll also uh you know people will also target businesses and sports events that are trans inclusive so for example in los angeles uh this, uh, the Wee Spa, this Korean spa that's trans inclusive uh they ended up facing protests from both turfs and fascists and then um, TERFs also uh, protested both inside and outside of swim meets uh, where Leah Thomas was competing uh, while she was competing during the NCAA championships. Uh, we've also seen TERFs protest outside of women's prisons for housing trans women. And they're not against prisons. Like they want trans, they want prisons to exist and they want a lot of trans women to be in prisons, but they want trans women to be in men's prisons where they're at a high risk of facing violence and assault. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, it's, they're like scaremongering about how supposedly uh, trans women are a danger to cis women and completely ignoring the fact that prisons themselves are inherently violent and, you know, violent towards all people who are incarcerated, mm -hmm. whether they're cis or trans. Uh, so yeah, they're not, they're not abolitionists. Some of them have even made anti-abolitionist statements. Like they want to use the prisons, but they just want to make sure that trans women are housed uh, 
with cis men. They're they're fine with prisons as long as it falls into their personal politics. Yeah, because again, they are cultural feminists. They the, like using prisons and police and incarceration is a is a core part of their politics. But again, um, so also uh, you know going after drag shows and events. Like actually, some of uh, the people who ended up protesting outside of the hospitals and clinics got their start disrupting drag queen story hours at libraries. Like for example, Lynn Meager and Don Land. Don Land ended up organizing a whole lot of uh, clinic protests in uh, the Seattle Tacoma area. They both disrupted drag queen story hours, but like years before they did the clinic protests. Uh, we've also seen uh, workplace harassment of specific trans people. Like for example, in Port Townsend, uh, there was a young trans woman uh, who was working at the local YMCA, who became uh, a target of both online and in-person harassment. And there were two rallies uh, in Port Townsend targeting her, one that was organized by TERFs and one that was organized by uh, members of the far right. And both groups attended each other's rallies. Uh, and there was also, uh, TERFs also crashed the uh, trans-led Netflix walkout. So when trans people who worked at Netflix were protesting uh, transphobic content, like for example, Dave Chappelle's show and fighting for better working conditions. Some turfs showed up basically to like, you know, be on the side of the corporation while <laughs> still trying to claim that trans people are part of, you know, this capitalist plot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, supposedly we're part of this like capitalist plot by evil transhumanist billionaires. And yet when trans people are like, trans workers are fighting both for, you know, better working conditions as workers and as trans people, the turf side with the corporation. Um, it's just, it's completely ridiculous. Yeah, but you know, these aren't very consistent people, but aside from just hating trans people in any way they can. But, and then also another very uh, common form of protest we've seen are so-called speakers corners, AKA, you know, public hate fests where Turfs and other anti-trans activists would just like choose a, a space in public to just come out and just broadcast their hatred and propaganda and misinformation and conspiracy theories all over to whoever will listen. And this uh, tactic was originally popularized by a uh, right-wing uh, UK anti-trans activist, Kelly J. Keene. She started holding these so-called speakers corners in different cities in the UK. And then US TERFs uh, were inspired by that and started copying that tactic. And then uh, late last year, uh, Keen actually traveled uh, to the US and staged a whole bunch of her rallies across the country, which we are now going to talk about. Okay, mm -hmm. so the uh, 2022 Let Women Speak Tour. So again, like Kelly J. Keen, she used to call herself a feminist, now she doesn't. Uh, she actually stopped calling herself a feminist, she says, because she was getting too much criticism from UK feminists who didn't like how she was hanging out with the far right. So now she calls herself a populist, but I think I, we I all think know what she, that means. She's just a fascist. I just consider her, you know, a fascist who focuses specifically on trans people. Um, so Kelly J. Keen, also known as Posey Parker, she has ties to all kinds of awful people and groups. Um, here in the US, she has ties to groups like Wolf, um, Heritage Foundation, Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, she was a member of Hands Across the Isle, which was one of the first groups where uh, TERPs and conservatives worked together. She's appeared in a lot of right-wing media. She was on this white nationalist named uh, Jean-Francois Garippe's show. She also appeared on Sebastian Forca and Tucker Carlson's show, and she has ties to Andy Ngo. Uh, she's expressed admiration for Tommy Robinson, who's the founder of the far-right English Defense League. Uh, so if you go to a rally organized by Kelly J. Keen, you are going to a far right rally. Um, but also, uh, you know, a lot of members of uh, the far right in the U.S. also end up showing up at her rallies when she was doing her U.S. tour. So, you know, she you know, started her tour on the West Coast and then worked her way east. So uh, her first rally in L.A., uh, Hero Rodriguez was one of the main organizers of the We Spa protests. He made an appearance at her first rally. Uh, claimed to just be walking through the neighborhood, which I don't believe at all. Of course um, and then also in, in San Francisco, uh, Derek Jensen showed up with Leo Keith. He didn't say anything. He didn't speak. They just like looked around. He, he just stood around looking miserable. Um, and also our duty, uh, this anti-trans group that's mainly uh, made up of transphobic parents, they, they also had members at the rally in San Francisco. Our duty just organized this uh, right-wing detransitioner rally just yesterday in Sacramento. 
uh, you know, where fascists showed up to that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, going back to Keaton's tour, so Proud Boys showed up in Chicago and Miami and possibly also in Philadelphia. Um, there were people, pe there were people working security for the rally in Philadelphia who people suspected were members of a far right group, possibly the Proud Boys. They were masked up hiding their identities. But in any case, they definitely showed up in Chicago and Miami. In Miami, one of them actually spoke. They, he was the last person to speak. In Chicago, uh, the Proud Boy took a selfie with Kelly J. Keene. Uh, Keene also ended up attending some like Republican and conservative events while she was in the States. Uh, she canceled her Portland rally, uh, but ended up going to this Republican uh, event instead for this gubernational candidate. And also she did a lot of networking with conservatives when she was in uh, Ladoon County in Virginia, which has been kind of like a hot spot of uh, conservative activist parent organizing. Mm -hmm. So when she went to Ludon County, Keen, uh, but before, during, and after her rally, she connected with these like conservative activist mothers um, who like these conservative uh, moms kind of got their start going after uh, anti-racist curriculum in the Ludon school system and then expanded into going against like, you know, uh, COVID precautionary measures and vaccines, and then, you know, going after uh, queer and trans uh, affirmative curriculum. So so before her rally, Keen ended up like uh, she had a party that was put on by this uh, this reporter from the Christian Post, Brandon Showalter. And then during her rally, a whole bunch of these like conservative mom activists ended up like showing up and speaking. And then after her rally, she attended uh, this conservative mom's rally outside of a school board meeting, Stacey Langdon. Uh, Stacey Langdon is one of the people who's like calls uh, queer and trans curriculum in schools, pornography, and is trying to get it out. Um, so Keen made a, obviously made a point of, you know, trying to connect with this, these particular kinds of activists and also tried to like uh, tell TERFs that they should network with these people and learn from their tactics. Like, and that, and she did that throughout her entire tour too, but it was especially uh, obvious and apparent in Ladoon County. So in Austin, she also had uh, far right people doing security for her. In uh, this case, uh, Kyle KD Sims and his team was doing security. He's part of this far right militia called This Is Texas Freedom Force. Also, uh, Michelle Evans, who's a Republican pan candidate in Moms for Liberty, she showed up there, uh, called herself a uh, trans exclusionary Republican female. <laughs> At the Tacoma <laughs> rally, uh, you know, some of those people I mentioned before, uh, Dawn Land, Lynn Beeger, and some other women who got their start uh, crashing drag queen story hours uh, and, you know, protesting outside of clinics and hospitals. They were there in addition to doing various anti-trans activism. A lot of them like to attend uh, far right, like anti-mask, anti-vax rallies, pro-police rallies. Like, you know, they'll go to stuff organized by people like Three Presenters, Patriot Prayer. Uh, those kind of folks. And then in, um, you know, New York City, there was right wing media there giving the turf table coverage. And also Jennifer Lal, uh, this anti surrogacy activist who's now getting into anti trans activists also was there. She's um, the head of Center for Bioethics and Culture Network. And she recently made a transphobic uh, detransition documentary called the Detransition Diaries. So one of the only pretty much the only rally where we didn't see some like right wingers obvious right wingers show up as far as we know was dc and here's the thing so dc was organized by kara dansky who's you know the current president of wdi in the us um so she when she gave her main speech she was talking about she tried to distance herself from white supremacists and groups like the proud boys while also saying you know it was fine to work with like you know quote unquote respectable republicans and groups like the heritage foundation and stuff like that and also saying that like kelly j keen could invite you know whoever she wanted to her rallies she was kind of like talking out of both sides of her mouth and i think she was just worried about optics uh which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute but um while kelly j keen was in dc she did end up stopping over at the heritage foundation mm-hmm so I just want to give folks an idea of how this, es whoops, I am so sorry about that. Um, okay, let's go back to that. I want to give folks an idea of how this escalation has been kind of like manifesting 
over the, the course of the past couple of years here, right? So in late 2020, this was when we saw the, the formation of the U.S. chapter of Women's Declaration International. It was also the soft launch of the Gender Mapper Project. She did not have socials at that particular point, but she was already connecting in with um, anti-trans organizers and using their YouTube channels to kind of like disperse her message, right? This was also the time period where the first ruling for the Bell versus Tavistock case in the UK happened. The Bell versus Tavistock case is something that was brought by Kira Bell, a detransitioned woman um, against the Tavistock Gender Identity Development Services Clinic. The original ruling was in her favor. Now, it has been overturned since then, but this ruling is important on our end because of the fact that Immediately afterwards, we started to see some clinic protests happening on the ground, citing this ruling as inspiration. Mm -hmm. Like people would have signs that say, who is Kira Bell? Yeah. Like they would try to make a connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So by early 2021, you know, the clinic protests were, you know, they were becoming more prolific. They were expanding into an international campaign, stretching into the likes of Canada and Brazil using community partners. There was the Women Pick at DC event um, that was protesting. I think it was like an executive order by the Biden administration. Were, yeah, I forget what the exact thing was, but they were definitely, they were protesting the Biden administration for being too pro-trans in their eyes. Yeah, it was sponsored by Wolf as well as the, the US chapter of Women's Declaration International. This is also the time period where we saw the first quote unquote D-Trans Awareness Day, which was originally developed by D-Transition TERFs. Um, and they claimed that they wanted to create something that was politically neutral. What ended up happening was that they attracted fascist coverage of their event. And when challenged on this, didn't want to take any sort of real stance against it, right? And I, I'm sorry, but if your event is getting fascist coverage, it's not a politically neutral event. Mm -hmm. um, by late 2021, you know, school boards were starting to get targeted by mass protests, especially over in Virginia, right? A lot of these were focused on, um, you know, anti-racist curriculum, but you could also start to see some anti-trans folks show up in the crowds wearing t-shirts and the likes, right? So this was starting to, to kind of coalesce um, and eventually would escalate over time to where they're starting to like go into the actual meetings. During this time period, we also saw the We Spa protests. Again, the turfs were crashing, the Netflix walkout, and unfortunately, the only informed consent clinic in Knoxville, Tennessee burned down. Now, the People investigation, like yeah, the investigation for that has been ongoing for a while now. They did lead, uh, they did ultimately conclude that the motivation was anti-abortion, but seeing as reproductive rights and trans liberation are inherently linked, and again, it was the only informed consent clinic in that section of Tennessee, like it's going to have an impact regardless. And like, we've also been seeing anti-abortion activists like start to take up like anti-trans like views and politics as well. In fact, like I, I found like a couple of these like right-wing couple, they started off as like hardcore anti-abortion uh, activists and now are focused more on anti-trans activism. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it like, you know, makes sense that they're like, people are gonna attack both. So by early 2022, this is when we started to see the escalation of quote unquote rumor rhetoric. Um, we started to see a lot more uh, pop-up events for uh, D-Trans Awareness Day as that was coming around again in March. Um, a lot of them had a, a more explicit slide into the right wing or conversion therapy direction instead of being led by D-Trans TERFs this time. And over time, you know, we would see an increase in explicitly right-wing events targeting trans people. By late 2022, so like, you know, Pride era onwards, um, fascist protests were starting to escalate, right? They were starting to, to target uh, Pride events and community centers and the likes. We saw the, uh, the Port Townsend rallies happen. Um, the, the National Political Convention for WDI USA bringing in, you know, some of the some of the, the early swerfs into to their movement. And then, you know, as we covered before, uh, Kelly J. Keene's, uh, you know, nationwide Let Women Speak tour. Right now, here in early 2023, you know, we've got yet more D-Trans Awareness Day events, the one happening just yesterday, we've got more happening tomorrow. In some ways, one could call our current 
conversation here today, a counter event to those um, to focus on community, um, you know, education and networking and the likes here instead of directly feeding them oxygen. We also saw the emergence of Jamie Reed, a supposed whistleblower out of Missouri. Now, you know, a lot of people have been digging into her story. Elements of it are completely bunk. I mean, she's going on about people like supposedly identifying as attack helicopters. Like this, th this is not real. Her, her story mm -hmm. is not real, but it's gaining a lot of traction. And, you know, most recently we also had uh, CPAC 2023 where Michael Knowles gave his whole th big thing about wanting to eradicate transgenderism from public society. I think we all know what that means. So part three, who to watch for? Okay, yeah, we're gonna go over uh, some notable uh, anti-trans activists and also like some that we feel kind of like represent certain um, categories of, of mm -hmm. trans activists. First, kind of like an overview of different types of anti-trans activists. Um, and obviously like people can belong to more than one of these categories. Uh, so we have uh, anti-trans parents, uh, which, you know, it can be, you know, parents who are just opposed to trans people, but oftentimes uh, these are parents of, uh, you know, trans people, youth or adults. Uh, and thankfully, a lot of the time their children uh, get away from them, but not always. Um, but, you know, they, um, you know, they want to stop, especially young people from transitioning um, and, you know, replace medical transition with conversion therapy and you know most of them want to like they might focus more on uh youth transition but really they want to wipe out all medical transition um and then you have uh healthcare professionals which i guess would include uh conversion therapists even though what they're doing is not healthcare at all but uh so it goes so but it also would include like any sort of uh transphobic healcare professionals or, you know conclude social workers, nurses, doctors, uh, many of whom are, you know, specializing in stuff that has nothing to do with, with trans health at all whatsoever. But regardless, they try to leverage their position uh, as healthcare professionals, like use that as like establish their authority to uh, attack trans people. And then you have uh, desisted and detransition people, which, you know, obviously most people, like most desisted and detransition people are not part of the anti-trans movement, want nothing to do with it. But um, there is a small minority that does get into anti-trans activism, and our their stories are used as uh, propaganda to you know, justify attacks mm -hmm. on trans people and trans healthcare. And sometimes they will physically show up to these events. So as true believers, um, but functionally speaking, they're being used by the the rest of the the rest of the group as propaganda. Yeah, and they can be like. You know they can lean more per for right wing or whatever a more general anti-trans but um and yeah of course we have our turfs uh which you know would include anti-trans feminists but at this point like the term turf like has mutated to include all sorts i mean it it almost can just mean like a, a cis woman who's anti-trans who you know engages in anti-trans activism because you like i think i mentioned like michelle evans before who showed up at kelly jakeen's rally in austin she called herself uh, a trans inclusionary Republican female. Um, so, you know, it eventually started in, you know, anti-trans strains of feminism, but now like all kinds of like conservative and right-wing women are also calling themselves TERFs, um, you know, and so, yeah, so we have these like, you know, right-wing Christian women and conservative activist moms and Republicans who are, you know, willing to work with TERFs or, you know, any of people in the other categories in order to attack uh, trans people, and then, you know, there are fascists who have figured out that uh, transphobia is a great way to recruit people into reactionary politics and activism. And uh, one thing that all of these groups have in common is that they're all majority white. Like, obviously, people of color can also get involved in anti-trans activism and even achieve, like, leadership roles in the movement. But overall, the movement is uh, overwhelmingly white, which shouldn't be that surprising because like transphobia completely intersects with uh, white supremacy. White supremacy needs to control what people can and can't do with their bodies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, control access to healthcare and enforce like very strict like 
gender roles in order to survive. So like, yes, like white supremacy needs transphobia and vice versa in order to keep going. Um, Another thing that I want to stress is the fact that so like while we have some of these types here laid out for for folks, none of them are mutually exclusive, right? mm -hmm. You're going to be seeing people that fall into multiple categories. We know of anti-trans parents that are TERFs. We know of anti-trans parents that are like blatantly right-wing women or fascist, right? Or healthcare professionals. or even who claim to be desisted. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah, so, so people can, yeah, people can fit into more than one category. And also, um, while, you know, all these people can end up working together, they can all end up fighting each other and having conflicts. And there's actually like quite a lot of power struggles uh, between groups and individuals. Like partially because, I mean, a lot of them are also, like they're all tend to be very authoritarian, abusive, controlling people with, fragile egos. And so, you know, they all kind of want to be the one dominating and controlling what happens. And so there's like a lot of just power struggles and infighting all the time, uh, mm-hmm. which, you know, thankfully weakens their movement and takes up a lot of their time and energy. Absolutely. Okay, so here's the Eric Keith, uh, who, you know, we've already been talking about quite a bit. Um, you know, one of the founders of Deep Dream Resistance and also the founder of Women's Liberation Front. So, you know, in 2013, uh, you know, DGR was largely kicked out of environmentalist and anarchist and radical communities. And so uh, having failed to uh, co-opt and recruit people in those groups, the Arkeith turned to, um, you know, turf and radical feminist and lesbian feminist groups and had way more success um, uh, recruiting and co-opting uh, those movements for her own aim. And so she, like her and Wolf were one of the main driving forces of like pushing of like the right wing and fascist creep among TERFs. Uh, her group was pretty much one of the first ones to end up making alliances with uh, conservative Christian groups like Alliance Defending Freedom and Heritage Foundation and Family Policy Alliance, which a lot of TERFs were like not into. Like they didn't, they didn't want that. They see themselves, you know, despite their reactionary views on trans people they do see themselves as part of the left and want to work with the left um but in any case so Lear Keith I believe that she didn't just end up making alliances with uh conservative groups to gain access to like money and power to go after trans people I believe she also did that to dominate the larger turf movement because she thinks like yeah she she doesn't care about sisterhood or community or anything like that she just wants power and you know, even uh, among more right wing leading turfs, she tries to dictate what they can and can't do. Um, it, it, one of the things she's very insistent on is like her interpretation of nonviolent direct action, which means like you know, if uh, like not fighting back. Uh, basically, she has this idea that like you try to stage these anti trans protests and val- rallies, um, and then supposedly believing that like pro trans people will attack them and they'll just like take the like they're just supposed to take the violence and then somehow that will show how violent trans people are Mm -hmm. which isn't really what happens like like when people show up to oppose the air keith they typically you know they don't come armed with like bats or anything they come armed with pies uh, (laughs) or eggs maybe and then you know the air you know in oakland the air keith ended up with a face full of pie and no one you know people just thought that was amusing (laughs) yeah which is probably why at these various events she just ends up looking so incredibly sad he he chose a really depressed looking leader keith photo um so there's also uh kara dansky who uh you know was in dgr we suspect she's still a member of that organization she was in uh wolf for many years and is now currently the president of women's decoration international usa uh, chapter chapter. um so before you know getting into turf activism, she formerly worked for the Department of Homeland Security and was a lawyer at the ACLU. Uh, while with Wolf, she was one of the first turfs to start appearing on right wing media. She went on Fox News and uh, has been on Tucker Carlson. I don't know how many times. I think she was just on there on his show like a few days ago. Uh, yeah, she's she's another turf who encourages uh, turfs to work with groups like ADF. Um, and uh, International Women's Forum, or, sorry, International Independent Women's Forum. Um, and like we were saying, like she doesn't like the optics of TERFs, uh, right wing groups appearing at TERF events and vice versa. And but as you can see in this like. picture, uh, so she's at a uh, speaker's corner that took place in Philly. And if you can see behind her, there's a man uh, wearing a t shirt with the Punisher logo. And beneath that, it says Ultra Maga, 
Uh, and that image ended up circulating uh, after the rally, just you know, make the very clear point like, oh, hey, turfs and fascists, look at that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we speculate she may have gotten a talking to from someone. We still, we may think like, like it's pretty clear that um, she still is very connected to Lear Keith. And a lot of people do kind of see uh, the US chapter of WGI as basically being a wolf front group. Um, so yeah, and like, so WDI and Wolf are kind of like the most powerful turf groups, you know, in the US, largely because they do work with the right and so get access to more like money and power and connections and all that. But they've made a lot of enemies, like getting to that point of power. So there's a lot of turfs who like, like I said before, like see themselves as being part of the left, want to work with the left, like are angry, um, you know, they're opposed to uh, Wolf and Dansky and all those people like working with the right and feel like that's kind of like ruined their chances to infiltrate the, the, the left because people now associate turfs with right wing politics and I mean, they think they're all right wing no matter what, even if they do <laughs> identify with the left. Mm -hmm. But so so there's ones that are like they're that are mad at those groups because they see them as too right wing. But then there are other turfs who basically see Wolf and WDI as not being fascist enough. And these mm -hmm. are the ones that take because um because WDI also insists on nonviolent tactics, and a whole lot of turfs want to fight and use violence against counter protesters or you know just trans people on the street, like you know, against you know a trans woman using the woman's restroom or something like mm -hmm. that. Like the like at this point, like we're seeing more turfs like embrace violent tactics, and so they're opposed uh to groups like Wolf that want everyone to stay nonviolent. In fact, one of the people that ends up butting heads with some of them here is Joey Bright. Yeah, and Joey Bright in the past has also advocated for nonviolent direct action. So I think like I think her views have shifted and now she's more willing to embrace uh like violence against pro trans activists. Um but anyway, so she uh Joey Bright is an older anti-trans lesbian feminist. She's held anti-trans views for decades. Uh, she claims to be a desister, meaning that she once uh, tried to pursue medical transition, but says she went to a therapist who convinced her that she was actually suffering from internalized misogyny. So she's basically been through some form of conversion therapy. Uh, she's very influenced by the theories of Jennifer Bielek. Uh, she also is friends with Alex Aaron, the gender mapper. And uh, when Alex Aaron has visited Joy Bright in Oakland and they've trolled plant parenthood clinics together where like they pretend to be a couple and pretend that joey is interested in starting testosterone so they, you know they go to a planned parenthood and the planned parent is like okay here's information about starting testosterone and then they like you know take their informed consent sheets about information about testosterone and act like they've like somehow mm -hmm. uncovered this scandalous information um and you know it's just yeah. a handout it should be noted that alex aaron is a um is a fan of Project Veritas, which has used mm -hmm. these tactics before in a broad variety of contexts, right? And so like these two physically showing up at a Planned Parenthood and trying to extract this information and then disseminate it over the internet, they are replicating Project Veritas tactics mm -hmm. specifically to target like, you know, trans healthcare. Yeah, and yeah, and often I'm like, they really like to go hard against like Planned Parenthood. Oh yeah. Too. Um, so Joy Bright, I mean, her, her group, which is really just her, was Can I Get a Witness? She organized this online conference uh, called Can I Get a Witness in 2020, uh, which is just basically like 12, 13 hours of different transphobic people like talking, you know, just spewing their bullshit. Sounds absolutely awful. But um, in any case, that led to some anti-trans parents like getting in touch with Joey. Um, and that led to these like protests like uh, Joey helping to organize these protests across the country outside of different clinics and hospitals. Um, and you know, she helped kind of like train people and share tactics and strategy and all that. And she organized uh, 15 protests outside of hospitals across the country in uh, 2021. Joey is also calls herself a hardliner, meaning like, you know, some parts of the anti-trans movement is willing to work with like uh, token trans people who believe in like, you know, gender critical anti-trans ideology um, you know, to try to try to make themselves look more moderate, for example, whereas Joey Bright, you know, and others like her don't want to work with uh, any trans people at all whatsoever. Like like she'll attack her, people like her will attack uh, gays against groomers because gays against groomers will work with, you know, right wing trans people. So gays against groomers is not anti-trans enough for Joey Bright. 
and other turfs like her who you know consider themselves hardliners. Um, okay. Let's check over to. Okay, so now we're in a uh, Amy Skirza, um, also known as known heretic. That's kind of her personal influencing brand. Um, so Amy Souza, um, like she has organized some on the ground protests, uh, including uh, she we found out about her because she was one of the organizers of Women Picket DC, which we talked about briefly. This like big turf event that happened in. Washington DC to protest the Biden administration for supposedly being too pro-trans. So I don't anyway, so but she mostly um does uh live streams like remotely. She will live stream anti-trans events, both those that are organized by turfs and those organized by right wingers. Um, and she will live stream stuff happening like all across the country. And that's not just a way to like promote the events and you know give away for anti-trans people to view them, but it's also a place where they can like socialize and hang out and talk. And often the live stream will start before the actual event and continue like for hours afterwards. So like the event itself will be like an hour, but the total live stream will be something like three hours because they're all talking and sharing and networking. And even like turfs from like other countries will sometimes like, you know, join the chat or they'll have like call in portions of the live stream or whatnot. So it's a way to sort of like, like Amy Souza is one of the turfs. Like I was talking about how they do a lot of infighting. Well, she's one of the ones who helps kind of be like a peacemaker and helps kind of like try to like, like bring people together and smooth out conflict and like praise people for their work, try to like, mm -hmm. you know, boost morale and stuff like that, which like, there's not a lot of people like her doing that stuff. So she actually ends up playing kind of an important role in terms of like helping for more sustainable activist networks for the turfs. Um, she also will lead harassment campaigns against trans women. Uh, so she lives in Port towns in Washington and she was like a major player uh, against like leading the harassment campaign against that young trans woman uh, who was working at the YMCA there. And she was one that like she helped uh, start online harassment, but also she helped organize the first rally that took place in Port Townsend. Um, yeah. And then uh, also often appearing alongside Amy Souza is Patty A, also known as a gay programmer. Oh, so a could you, uh, I think we're losing audio just a little bit there if you want to come back to the start of Kat. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I was just saying, uh, is this better? Yeah, Can you, you hear sound me better? very clear now. Thank you. Okay, yeah. cool. So I was just saying, so here's, we're going to introduce Kat Yang, also known as the programmer. She has a website called Stop Female Erasure. She lives somewhere in New York. And again, I was saying she often appears alongside Amy Souza, again, kind of like remotely hosting these live streams uh, of you know, turf events. And she like formally did uh, environmental and anti colonial activism. We found evidence of that. She claims to have been like uh, formally engaged in like LGBT activism and calls herself a whistleblower, supposedly exposing how you know queer and trans people were grooming children. But we actually haven't found any evidence that she was doing any sort of like like major queer or trans activism. Like, um, so I mean, maybe she worked at like a trans like a, a queer youth group at some point. But I, I mean, I don't. I think she's kind of just like making things up because now she appears on places like. Uh, you know, Fox News and Glenn Beck and, you know, tells her her whistleblower story. But um, she's, you know, a conspiracy theorist. So again, like many turfs, like spreads conspiracy theories about trans people, linking trans people to transhumanism. Also likes, like, all of this is also supposed to involve the UN too, and also tends to work in like sex trafficking, conspiracy theories as well. She also likes to make really awful art mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of illustrates her conspiracy theories and transphobia and often anti-semitism as well so you know she has a very distinctive si uh, style you'll see her signs yeah. at protests so well. yes oh yeah no she they i mean i saw them all over uh kelly j keen's tour like all over the country people were using her signs and like banners and stuff like that and she also will make like flyers promoting the event just like all kinds of art for protests and propaganda and also she does um, police liaison work for turf rallies. She did a lot of police liaison work for uh, Keene's rally in New York City and made sure, try, like, tried to make sure that there was a very strong police presence because the turfs know that they need to rely on police violence um, and force in order to host their rallies in many cities because they know the local communities don't want them there. Um, and, you know, it's also very telling that the police will show up and provide mm -hmm. protection for the turfs. 
it's, you know, this is another example of how you know, perps are cultural feminists. Like they want to use the, like they're, they're fine with the police. They want to use the police to like, you know, get people arrested or like, you know, prevent people from disrupting the rally. And also they will definitely try to get counter protesters like arrested, mm -hmm. especially if they're trans, especially if they're trans women. Um, and yeah, and she will share her, uh, you know, she not only does this work, but tries to teach other turfs how to uh, establish good relationships with the cops as well. And now we have Jeanette Cooper, uh, who's an example of, you know, an anti-trans uh, parent activist. Uh, she's one of the founders of Partners for Ethical Care, which is largely made up of anti-trans parents. Uh, you know, one of the groups that kind of focuses on destroying uh, transition healthcare for youth in particular and replacing it with conversion therapy. She is the mother of a trans child, though thankfully her child is no longer in her custody. Um, she also is friends with Alex Aaron, the gender mapper, and Alex Aaron is one of the other co-founders of Partners for Ethical Care. So Cooper, uh, you know, in addition to attending anti-trans rallies, she also will travel to testify in favor of anti-trans bills, particularly those uh, banning healthcare. She also pays for the travel expenses of anti-trans, like detrans detransition people to travel and give testimony. And she was one of the organizers, uh, one of the local organizers for Kelly J. Keene's Chicago rally. She knows, I forget if the, she knows a Chicago police officer. I can't remember if he's retired or or not, but, but she was, because of her connections with an officer of the CPD, like she was able to get more of a police presence. So again, um, you know, relying on police protection, otherwise like, Chicago turned out and would have shut them down. I mean, they are. Oh, yeah. Because of a lot of disruption anyways. But, mm -hmm. um, he also uh, appeared in an anti-trans film made by uh, Independent Women's Forum. So she is also another uh, turf with connections to conservative groups. And then we're going to have two more here that we're focusing on mostly because of the aggro war. Yes, because these are some of the turfs that, uh, well, they get around and they also either have threatened violence or engaged in violence. So this is Jennifer Thomas uh, representing Rev Fox Rebellion and formerly out of Chicago, but now lives somewhere in Pennsylvania, I believe near Harrisburg. And she's another one that travels around. Like she traveled out to the Fort Townsend uh, rallies. This is the first one. And she's also organized like, quote unquote, speakers corners rallies herself, uh, including in like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. She was one of the local organizers for Kelly J. Keene's rallies in Philadelphia. Uh, she's another one that does a lot of police liaison work. In preparation for Kelly J. Keene's rally in Philadelphia, she gave the police cookies <laughs> to try to like win them over. And I guess it worked somewhat because they ended up with like metal barricades around Keene's yeah. rally. She, she encourages other people to, to give the police cookies too. Yeah, and she's another one, you know, who will try to get people arrested. She's really aggressive towards counter protesters. She films them and she tries to get up in people's faces and like, you know, try to tell people I want, to, want them to take off their masks, which you know, people are smart enough not to do, obviously. Um, and also she has sympathies with right-wing groups. Uh, I know she will put if she takes she takes videos and pictures and then puts them online and mm -hmm. um, has attempted like her and her friends have tried to get people doxxed for disrupting her rallies. She's also admitted to carrying like pepper spray and uh, made it clear that she believes that people like turfs should use more force against counter protesters. But she's also threatened to just mace like a trans woman just for using the women's restroom. Like she's super super aggro and dangerous and. Yeah. And then there's Gina. And then there's Gina, the turf who's uh, become infamous infamous for macing uh, high school kids at the Tacoma rally during Kelly Jenkins' tour. Um, so she's originally from, oh, she's from Colorado, she's living in Denver, and she, you know, also runs the Cannamama Clinic, where she promotes the idea that it's safe to smoke cannabis while you're pregnant. Uh, she's a Republican. She's a member of the local GOP. And also, uh, again, she she travels around to attend different turf rallies and events all across the country. Um, so she like she traveled out to like um, I believe it was somewhere in the East Coast to go harass uh, Leah Thomas with other turfs when Leah Thomas was competing in the NCA um, in, in swim meets. Um, so anyway, so she, you know, she travels armed with pepper spray, bear mace, sometimes knives. I believe she also spoke of of interest in getting a gun. Um, you know, she maced uh, teenagers and adults who were kind of protesting in Tacoma. She also pepper sprayed kind of protesters uh, in New York City. So she's another one and um, to watch out for. And also important to know, so 
after she you know maced kids in Tacoma, there was like sort of some debate among the turfs about whether that was okay or not. And overwhelmingly, mo- I mean, like, you know, Lear Keith was upset about that and tried to kick Gina out of the turf movement. But most turfs were like, no, that's that's great. That's awesome. Like they were like hailing her as a hero. Um, and that I think kind of like I feel like that kind of escalated um stuff. It kind of like represented a shift in mm-hmm. the larger turf movement, but made it clear that most of them were supportive and condoned violence, um, you know, against pro-trans activists. So countering the threat, learning from some of the current resistance efforts. And hopefully this is a, a section where we can kind of shift it into a more conversational piece here. But before we do that, I just want to mention that there's like, there's a few different possible planning stages to sort of take into consideration um, when trying to, to arrange a, uh, a counter resistance to any particular event before, during, and after, you know, but please note, none of these are mutually exclusive. Again, there are going to be different sections or techniques that you find yourself having to um, utilize during multiple different points of your resistance, right? And sometimes you also have to kind of like switch things up on the fly. So, you know, stay flexible as always. And then so so beforehand, you know, I I've definitely noticed that um, some of the things that's been really effective has been involving things like, you know, community education, right? In in a way, that's kind of what we're doing right now. Um, community education about the the realities of, you know, um, trans existence, but also the realities of the threats that we face. Um, building community support systems, like that's that's something that has a lot of meaning to me because like the best way that we can really resist any sort of like violence against us is for us to like build as strong of a a network and a community as possible taking care of you know each other's needs and accounting for any sort of like mutual aid that needs to be taken care of as well yeah the more resilient our communities are and the better we are able to support each other the more effectively we can resist those who attack us yeah so that's a very, very important thing. And it's like, you know, yeah. Um, and like, you know, it also accounts for like, you know, if there are immediate needs within your community that um, like somebody needs some help with, you know, if if they've recently lost their job, if they're at threat of losing their job because of harassment that's starting to come in, um, you know, if they've recently lost access to their health insurance or other form of health care, especially with the, the bands that are currently trying to go around, right? Um, you know, making sure that people have enough to eat, hence the table here, um, or having a roof over their heads, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and then um, one uh, step you could potentially take before, I mean, you know, once you find out that there is an anti-trans um, event happening, uh, you can attempt in some cases to, to platform people you know sometimes turfs try to speak at like libraries or hotels and sometimes you can get them uh deplatformed sometimes that, that's not always successful but in any case just making the attempt can like help uh it can be part of community education it can like inform people like hey this is going on and you're already kind of like engaging them in some form of resistance so even if the deplatforming event like isn't successful well you've got people's attention now and you can kind of like go from there to like Mm -hmm. the next step which will hopefully be more successful and then um the last one we're gonna uh, emphasize this a lot in fact it's like it's on every state every step here like um opposition monitoring so like you know you can't really do the community education without monitoring these people who Mm -hmm. you know are working to eliminate us so like figuring out like who are these people like who do they know? What are they doing? Like, what are, what is their network work? Like, what are they planning? So just kind of like watching them and then um, figuring out how to communicate that information uh, to communities so they can defend themselves. So this one, I, I really want to stress, um, I advise doing it with a team. I really do. It's not something that should be left on one person's shoulders, mm-hmm. in part because of the intensity of the work and, you know, burnout and stuff like that. And also just because like, you know, it's good to be able to sometimes fact check things with other people, right? Or if you need to be able to switch yeah. things out. Um, also, ideally, 
this is something that should be done by like teams that are already established and familiar with anti-fascist open source intel and security procedures, especially given the fascist crossover that we've been seeing, right? Um, if this isn't immediately available to, you know, try to try to connect in with regional chapters and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And like, like there is starting to be more uh, monitoring of curves and anti-trans groups, but there could definitely be a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. There's just like so much to cover and monitor. I feel like we end up feeling like we're stretched pretty thin. So I definitely like, I really want more people to get involved and, um, you know, uh, yeah watching these groups, at least finding out about like local people in their area. Um, I end up writing a whole report about Kelly J. Keene's US tour, which hopefully it's in the editing stages now. So hopefully that'll be out soon. And that um, goes more extensively and deeper into some of these networks we've been uh, talking about here. So that could also help hopefully jumpstart like more uh, mm -hmm. deeper. All right. People. And then during, this is kind of like one of the, the big points that we've been seeing here a lot, right? And like I, like we mentioned before, opposition monitoring, I, I swear it never ends, um, which is the other part of why you want to do it with a team, right? It literally never ends. Um, but, you know, we've, we've definitely seen a, a broad range of different kinds of strategies happening um, in terms of countering different kinds of events, whether that's protesting the events themselves, running counter events, or doing both at the same time. Yeah, so um, protesting, like what we've seen um, people do to kind of like disrupt a lot of turf events is like, well, one, you know, people, it's good to hide your identity uh, mm -hmm. because they will, they will try to dox you. A lot of them will, or like, you know, and then, you know, realize that, you know, some of them are violent. A lot of them will, if they can find a way to get you arrested, they will. But, uh, but like noise making, they, they hate, <laughs> they hate noise uh, as a way of disrupting their rally. You know, you can bring like bang on pots and pans, bring musical instruments, noisemakers, play music, you know, chant, scream, like whatever. Just like drown, drown their transphobia out. Um, also good is like lots of like uh, signs, banners, flags. Like they really hate signs that talk about their connections with the right, even though they're working with like right wing groups like all the time. They hate it when people in their you know when their opponents point that out. Um, you can even, you know, you can say just like first work with fascists or you can name particular organizations or individuals. Uh, mm -hmm. Also pointing out their violence, like the, their, after uh, Gina Hawk, like uh, based those kids in Tacoma, there were lots of signs like throughout the rest of the tour, like people showed up with signs to say Terps mates kids. Yep. They hated that, they hated that so much. It's just like, an, it's an easy way to send like a very like clear and simple message to passersby about like, why are you standing around this group of people making lots of noise and like causing lots of disruption? It's like, oh, you're trying to disrupt a hate group. Okay, that like maces kids. Okay, that has ties to the right. Also, also there is another benefit to organizing a counter protest. And that's the fact that sometimes, not always, but sometimes if they know that there's going to be confrontation, they might just cancel. Mm -hmm. Not always. Or it like, yeah, they'll or less people will come if they know, because a lot of them don't want to, like they do not want to fight any disruption. Like they just want to be able to show up and just spew a whole bunch of transphobic bullshit unopposed. So like just putting out a flyer, like can, like saying that, hey, this turf event is happening can sometimes scare them away from coming. Mm -hmm. um, so, there, so aside from like, you know, directly confronting the event, you can also hold like counter events that tend to focus more on like, you know, celebrating trans joy, uh, providing resources for the local trans community, like just giving people like a fun event to hang out at and just to sort of demonstrate that, you know, these uh, hateful anti-trans assholes like can't take away trans joy and resilience. Mm -hmm. Um, you can and you can have both going on at the same time. You can have uh, a counter event taking place at the same time as having a uh, you know, direct uh, direct confrontation of the actual uh, turf rally. All right, and then afterwards, again, opposition monitoring, as I said, never ends. Um, but you know, as a as a result of the things that can end up happening. Um, and you know, incorporating the the things that you learn from the events themselves, or keeping an eye on their socials and the likes. You know, um, 
you might find yourself writing up reports about what actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, I wrote up a whole report about Kelly J. Keene's U.S. tour, which hopefully mm -hmm. will get out uh, in the near future. Sometimes you end up writing reports even if they don't physically show, as evidenced here by the report from Puget Sound's anarchist um, anti-trans rally in Olympia canceled in the face of opposition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Terps will obviously be uh, putting out their own like propaganda about what happened, uh, which usually is you know, full of lies and distortions. So it might be uh, useful to correct the record and make clear what actually happened. Um, you know, especially if they're alleging that like they suffered some kind of like attack on them uh, that could involve like correcting the record could be part of uh, community self-defense, like supporting someone who is being harassed by turfs afterwards. And then, and then community care events. This is really critical for a number of reasons. First of all, dealing with anti-trans events is incredibly physically and psychologically taxing, right? People are going to need that decompression time and being able to reconnect with their people and really be able to like, you know, feel that sense of, of community um, as they're recovering from this stuff. But you also might have to, to take into consideration things like, you know, bail funds in other words like what is the impact yeah you know did someone get injured did someone get arrested like is someone you know traumatized like mm -hmm. what do people need like you know yeah. like yeah just make it like again it's just like taking care of your community honestly um, i would argue that community care events fall into a range of these different categories here too because like i mean support spaces that's something that could be useful pretty much across the board um you know always having to to you know beef up uh, bail funds. Then there's like donor drives um, for, for impacted individuals, especially if, um, you know, they're dealing with direct instances of violence or if they've lost their job or they're dealing with malicious litigation. Um, but, you know, in connection to all of this, again, community education and networking is really, really critical. Like, yeah, because it's like using that as an mm -hmm. opportunity to like, again, like build like community support and resilience. And so, like, broadly speaking, um, you know, there's just some general things to, to consider, like this. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. We're, we're in this for our for our immediate survival, our long term survival and to keep like. Just the spirit of trans joy alive. Right. And so one of the things to consider, where are your support systems at right now? Are there areas where one or multiple people have increased needs that you're going to need to be able to account for, especially if that could directly impact your ability to directly respond to specific events. Second, priorities, right? If you are really stretched thin, you might have to like determine which kinds of events or like the, the degree of their reach that you decide to actually respond to, right? since you know this battlefield is not equally spread out right like we're experiencing just an onslaught of anti-trans events and stuff like that targeting our very existence and so like you know there there might be points where you find yourself having to pick and choose and that's okay that really is okay because ultimately speaking the thing that is the most important is that like you're still here and that you're doing okay right which goes into security, seriously, both physical and digital. Um, because like, like as, as things continue to escalate, we, we are starting to, to see, you know, more fascists physically showing up. And so different, um, different counter events that we've seen or counter protests um, have connected in with community defense um, in order to, to protect their members. Um, but because of the, the degree of hostility coming from, from the TERFs and how they're, you know, filming people and posting it on the internet and trying to get people doxxed and dogpiled and the likes, or right? Arrested. Like, like, or arrested, yeah. yeah. Like, take into consideration, like, what people's needs are in terms of digital security. Is their information still online? Do you need to use a system like Delete Me to remove your records of, like, where you live? Um, could somebody be um, like doxxed at work and then the mm -hmm. harassment ends up going over to there, that kind of thing, right? Um, and then like intersectional and 
international solidarity, right? Like trans people are incredibly diverse. You know, we come from a wide range of backgrounds, you know, trans people of color, disabled trans people, Jewish trans people, um, you know, all sorts of different kinds of experiences. And it's because of the fact that our opposition right now is pulling threads from so many different directions, it is absolutely critical to be continuously connecting in with other people's lived experiences, learning from those, understanding where your limitations are, and then, you know, respecting their own expertise um, mm -hmm. and their experiences in order to create a stronger movement. Yeah, and then also, you know, understanding how the struggle for trans liberation you know, connects to other liberation movements. Mm -hmm. um, there's a reason why people are focusing so much on how like, you know, trans people are supposedly like an extension of the porn industry, right? And that's because of the fact that trans rights and sex worker rights are directly yeah. linked. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but then right. like international solidarity, I mean, not just taking into consideration the fact that the United States is like an imperial machine um, with, yeah. like, you so know, what happens all across the world. What um, happens here can influence what happens all over the world. Absolutely. Um, but things also go vice versa, mm -hmm. right? Our clinic protests happened in direct response to things that were happening over in the UK. Yeah. And yeah, we can, we already demonstrated like, you know, the, 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 the speaker's corners tactics of Kelly J. Keene migrated over to the States. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, because the, the, the anti-trans movement is global. The resistance to it also has to be global. Like we were better able to respond to Kelly J. Keene's tour because we were already in communication with trans people from the UK. So we already had an understanding of who she was, yep. like what kind of, like what connections she had to right-wing people, like what her tactics were. So we were already kind of like able to like more quickly inform people in the US, like who she was, why she was dangerous and like why people should respond to her. Mm -hmm. uh, and like, you know, we're in contact with like other trans people in Europe, like some trans people in uh, Mexico and other parts of the world. And it's it's just good, like your, your like uh, analysis and activism deepen the more you like find out about like what's going on with other people, mm -hmm. like like they can tell you about what's going on with the anti-trans movement in uh, their country and, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, and, and vice versa uh, because it is all interconnected. And that's another way you can kind of like, again, build like trans uh, community and resilience on a global scale. Um, so it's like, you know, it's an opportunity to take this like global attack against us and turn it into something like um, radical that works towards liberation of all, not just trans people, but just all people. Mm -hmm. All right. And I know, again, we, we are kind of talkers, but as we, as we said here, we do end up covering a lot of ground. So I apologize for us like uh, kind of going over time here, but do you kind of want to be able to to connect in and you know answer questions because yeah yeah no apology necessary that was an incredible amount of information um really artfully synthesized for all of us who mm. have not done the level of research that y'all have <laughs> so I just want to take a moment to uh appreciate what an incredible job uh y'all have done with this presentation well thank you okay. yeah we like this is something that we've been wanting to piece together for people for a while now. And so it's a great opportunity to be able to condense some of that research into a single piece to be able to share with people. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I do wanna bring a couple of questions in from the chat, uh, but before I do that, I want to um, uh, name that uh, this event was also a fundraiser for the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. Um, folks may know, and I think it actually ties in really well to the content you were talking about, um, mm -hmm. particularly the way in which um, uh, kind of uh, ecological movements end up being kind of a primary site uh, of conflict between mm. um, anti-trans activists um, and the left. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, folks may know that this week was uh, a week of action to defend the Atlanta forest. Um, and actually today is the last day of that week of action. Uh, we were able, I think, to raise about $350 uh, in the run-up to the event today. Um, Yay! 
yeah, donations from folks who attended, uh, which is really fantastic. I am going to drop the link directly to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. Uh, it's also worth noting that a lot of the arrestees, and at this point there are um, uh, dozens of people who are facing literally terrorism enhancement charges uh, mm, simply for mm -hmm. occupying the forest in defense of the land and against the expansion of the police state. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of those folks, as it turns out, are trans. So this is one of those moments where we have a convergence of all of these uh, forces of liberation and also forces of repression in mm -hmm, the form mm -hmm. of, you know, the building of Cop City, uh, but also the arresting of trans people and all of these issues of carcerality. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to put that in the chat for folks so that uh, if you uh, were not able to make a donation previously but are open to doing so today, please do. It's incredibly important in this moment to support uh, folks who are facing repression in Atlanta mm -hmm. in defense of this mm -hmm. uh, important ecological resource and in opposition to the expansion of militarized policing in particularly black community. Um, so having said all that, let's let's hit a couple questions. There were some great questions in the chat and we, we may not be able to do all of them. Um, uh, so apologies to anyone who typed anything out that we don't get to, but uh, let's just pull, pull a couple here. There's a really good one. Um, from Emily about uh, what you know, what we can do, particularly um, when we are uh, not in a position to be listened to. So the question is, mm -hmm. um, as a trans person who won't be listened to, uh, are there methods for heading off a turf pipeline um, uh, for, rad for like radicalization and like sort of harm reduction resources for family members who mm -hmm. might dismiss trans perspectives? Um, any resources for folks who are in that position, as a lot of us are? Man, that's that's kind of a hard one, honestly. I've struggled with this particular one there myself. Um, and like I this can always be kind of a, a headache sometimes because we can't always rely on folks, but sometimes um sometimes it does really help to to have like a, a cis ally be the person that is delivering the message for you. If you're able to compile some resources that you know are informative, like sometimes you can end up making a difference by having somebody kind of like be the middle person for communicating mm -hmm. that stuff, right? If they're going to be listened to more than you, then, you know, protect yourself by, by funneling the information over into them. Yeah, and like there are a lot of trans people who are specifically um, working on combating like disinformation, mm -hmm. particularly like you know disinformation about like medical transition. I mean, we also do that, but we we know other people as well. And it's just like it seems to be like I mean, trans people tend to do do the best work doing that research, but then you do again run into this problem where we're not taken seriously and listened to. So like, yeah, sometimes you do kind of need a trans trans allies to kind of like act as like like. The mediator like passing the information on because mm -hmm. cis people list like you know trust other cis people more than us unfortunately yeah. it, but it, just like but it's like partially just like trying to get that information out i mean we that's one of the reasons why we will often try to like you know talk to the media both about like the stuff we talked to talked about today but also specifically about more kind of like uh the disinformation mm -hmm. angle yeah, because um, sometimes people will listen to the media more than they'll listen to trans people too. Right. You know, if we say it, you know, it doesn't count, but if it's in an article in like Time or whatever, like mm -hmm. suddenly it is, it counts. <laughs> it's, it's more authoritative. Right. Yeah, and I guess I it just generally, I think this kind of is, um, you know, I think th there's strategies here that aren't specific to uh, kind of resisting this particular flavor of radicalization, but just more generally, how do we uh, kind of confront that pipeline uh, mm -hmm. yeah. into, into right-wing conspiratorialism and whatnot. And I, I guess maybe I'll just throw out that like, you know, a lot of times looking for an opportunity to connect uh, someone who can speak from a similar identity to the mm -hmm. family member or friend. Yes. So for mm -hmm. instance, if you're, if you're working with uh, parents and they're, you know, maybe they're Christian or, or they're, you know, very religious, Finding someone who has a uh, a common faith but is mm -hmm. trans affirming, um, in order to amplify kind of the message that they might not hear from a more secular voice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think there's lots of different versions of this. The kind of like the cis ally is one of them. 
Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely. Uh, another question um, uh, that we got was um, kind of about the response from TERPs, uh, particularly I think in the last year or two, to uh, oppositional organizing. Um, mm. You know, how have TERPs uh, responded in the face of uh, you know, being deplatformed or, um, you know, having people fly their neighborhoods or, or the, the more theatrical kind of like getting pied type oh. of stuff. Well, they'll, uh, they'll get, if they get pied or some of that, they'll try to claim that that's like violence. So they'll, like they off, they basically like frame it as if it's like this awful, unfair, like violence or repression. Oh, uh, the way that Amy Seuss, I put it. Oh, there's there like a fist behind, behind that pie. Yeah. Yeah, they said all sorts of. Y'all said that fast, but you said there's a fist behind that pie. There's a fist (laughs) behind that That, pie. That is something. Also, tried to claim it was like some expression of a sexual fetish. They said all sorts of really absurd things about uh, people being pied in in Portland, but also when uh, Lear Keith also got pied in in, uh, Oakland too. When if I remember correctly, Lear Keith also called the police or or yes, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, they did. They that's the thing. They will try to call the police. Like basically, if they can find a way to extract revenge, they will. Like, um, they'll often try to run to the right wing media and like complain about it. They'll make a big stink about it. Um, uh, I think. Um, so yeah, they'll like they will try to lash out and kind of make a big deal, but it often just makes them look even worse. I feel mm-hmm. like it's just sort of like it's a pie. Like it's pie, you're not actually like it's like only really gonna appeal to people on who's already on their side. Um, right. Um, and fascists so, hate being ridiculed. They do, exactly, absolutely. Exactly. I think um, they hate that word. Like, yeah, they absolutely hate being like yeah. humiliated and ridiculed. And, and honestly, they they don't like a lot of like really large or loud confrontation either. So one of the things that we noticed, I believe this was happening over in Madison, where they were trying to oh, have yeah. these speakers' corners, right? So what ended up happening was they ended up facing so much resistance continuously every single time that they showed up they realized that they could not have their quote unquote speakers corners in person. So what did they do? They switched to quote unquote turf tea time in their apartment. apartment. So they just were like streaming themselves, like hanging out in an apartment, having tea and just like, you know, talking their weird turf nonsense. Um, So they'll go into their echo chambers essentially. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, um, a final question before we end out this uh, really informative um, uh, session. Uh, you know, y'all have really laid out a really kind of very comprehensive exploration of uh, the timeline for where a lot of these trends came from, how the tactics evolved. Uh, if you were going to make any predictions about the future, where do you think this fight is going to go from here? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So, I mean, I, I simultaneously have fear and hope, which I know sounds strange, but well, on the same token, I'm Jewish. So what can I say? Um, so, you know, there, there's always the, the sense of, of fear, right? You know, we're under attack, fascists are showing up at, at our spaces, they're you know, they're, they're throwing Molotov cocktails at our doors and stuff like that. And it, it generally sucks, right? So you are like afraid for your life. But while watching the Let Women Speak tour, honestly, that was really inspirational because after a certain point, once Portland hit, like sure, Kelly J. Keene canceled her section of the tour, but a couple of the people that were going to go to that stop decided to go ahead and try holding their own anyway. And they were, hilariously enough, met with pies, um, credible threats of pies. Um, (laughs) And from that point, Again, just like the whole situation with the burrito and deep green resistance, like all bets were off. And so they started experiencing more and more resistance with every single stop that they were at with a handful of exceptions. But like- Yeah, most stops she encountered resistance and then at her final stop, she couldn't even show. And so she like, you know, filmed this really pathetic like short video in a Starbucks, like having to repeat herself because the first time she's like, you know, being like, oh, I can't make it because the police won't escort me. And they're like, speak up. And they're like, oh, and you know, she just looked like a total mm-hmm. like mess and fool. And things like, like 
things can feel really intense in the moment and like we're isolated and alone and like the world is against us. But again, we are stronger together than we are alone. By connecting in with each other, both within our local communities and internationally, we do have what we need to survive. We are a truly resistant, uh, resilient people. Mm-hmm. And we will make it through Because, yeah, I just see, like, like, even since, like, Kelly J. King's tour happened, like, there are more people paying attention to, like, like, chirps and anti-trans activists and their overlap with fascism. Like, people are paying attention more and, like, figuring out who the lo- people in the local areas are and connecting with people. So, like, like I see, like, the movement, like, the movement for trans liberation and the focus of specifically on going up against chirps and fascists, it's going to just keep building and coming together and... Mm-hmm. um yeah, like this like, is like it's yeah. the tax against us are scary. And I definitely feel like things are like gonna get worse before they really get better. But I also see this as an opportunity for us to like again kind of like create stronger. Absolutely. And, and like and there there are so many people. We are. <laughs> there are so many people that I've been connecting in with throughout the course of all of this that are like like they give me hope. They give mm-hmm. me hope for the future. They give me hope for the immediate. Um, because they're just no matter how hard things are getting, they are truly dedicated to making sure that all of us are like safe and well and connected. And it's just, it just means so much to me. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you so much for all the love that you are putting into this work um, uh, to keep our community safe and to ensure that health liberation is achievable for all people. Yeah, Others- absolutely. Oh. So much we could talk to that we didn't get to tonight, um, you know, about the legislative landscape, about mm. book bans, so many things. But um, what I, I hope is that folks who were able to tune in and, and hear all this information are inspired to start organizing in their own communities if they aren't already, um, to do the oppositional research, um, you know, and, and uh, get in the streets and get loud, too. So thank you all so much. This has been a real treat and uh we will make sure that this content um is available for anyone who didn't make it tonight uh to stream at a later date all right and on that note have a great evening thanks to everybody who joined us